Page 8. The functions of this unit were directed by the commander of G-45 Depot and the following details were assigned. First, one officer and 30 enlisted men for the maintenance of engineers' equipment at the Newbury Race Course. Second, one officer and 20 enlisted men for salvage, storage, and issues of lumber at the lumber yard at the G-45 Depot. Third, one officer and 37 enlisted men for utilities at the G-45 Depot. Fourth, three officers and 84 enlisted men for the unit and camp overhead and processing of the unit's T&W equipment as received. As far as operations were concerned, the difficulties from the time of arrival were numerous. Trouble was found in attempting to maintain the integrity of the company, for Operation Unit's primary mission, and training due to work commitments assigned by the G-45 Depot. We considered the most important task of this organization was to perform our primary mission but until receipt of our equipment, we performed the work assignments in G-45 Depot with all effort to enable Depot to accomplish the supply mission. No major difficulties were encountered. All company officers were performing duties other than regular assignments, such as Camp Mess Officer, Camp Special Service Officer, Assistant Motor Officer for G45 Depot Motor Pool, Investigation Officer, Inventory Officer and Section Chief of the G45 Depot. Let us now hear what Albert Bernanke had to say about his first months in England. So anyway, uh, we were in Liverpool and they shipped us, and I'm not sure exactly where we were in England, we were down someplace in England, nothing to do. You know, they had no the, equipment? Nothing, we had no equipment, okay. nothing at that point. So make do, what do you do? Well, we're out taking, unpacking gliders and assembling them. Okay. <laughs> in these fields, they had these big, big wooden boxes full of gliders. Uh -huh. We well, knew what the gliders were for. But sure. They got nothing else to do. We're out there unpacking gliders. And eventually we did get equipment. And again, we were practicing up and down the you know, English countryside and we stayed at different places, you know, mm -hmm. different. Uh, and you'll see in some of these pictures or some of the pictures of places that we were. Uh, small town, a little small town of Chagford. I never heard of Chagford in my life, but it's a little tiny little town. Most of these were in. Uh, Southwestern England, mm -hmm. and uh, we were assigned trucks again. Machine, I had my machine shop again, and we would we were practicing different you know, driving and driving in these things on the wrong side of the road. And, <laughs> and some of these some of these small small uh, roads with the uh, they had hedgerows there too, you know. Yeah. Some parts of England, and that, yeah. that was kind of wasn't much room. But anyway, we uh, we spent that time in England and from, uh, that was in December until uh, sometime in early, I guess it was, uh, we were, again, we probably did, they made it, they were doing marching and all these crazy things. Right, things. maneuvers, were, practice, training. And, and so mm -hmm. we were waiting and in, uh, probably in sometime in uh, maybe June. Albert's time in England only covered about a minute and one half in time on his CD testimonial but in reality it was a very important time for the United States and England. The 965th engineer's time in England lasted about six months but during that time the preparation for the D-Day landings were being finalized. Page 8 of Lieutenant Booth's company history covers the 965th activities in England during the month of March 1944, his following pages, 9, 10 and 11 also cover their time in England for, April, May and June respectively. At the end of each of his pages of the unit's history, I will present the Allies planning, activities and objectives that took place for each of those months leading up to the D-Day landings. The 965th Engineers landed in England in January 1944 so I will begin in January 1944 to March 1944 to bring us up to date with what occurred during those months regarding the planning by the Allies for the D-Day landing in France. 1944 January, with the new year, the planning for D-Day takes on greater urgency. The newly appointed Allied commanders begin revising the draft plans that had been drawn up by Cossack. In particular, 
they decide that the number of troops to be landed in the first waves on D-Day needs to be considerably increased. Further naval forces and aircraft must therefore be found to support these additional troops. The target date for D-Day is moved from 1 May to 31 May, to allow time for these preparations. Midget submarines of the Combined Operations Pilotage Parties or COP secretly visit the Normandy beaches to take sand samples. These are needed to confirm that the sand on certain sections of the chosen landing beaches will support the weight of the tanks that the Allies planned to land on D-Day. Across many parts of Europe, including France, British and the United States aircraft begin to drop weapons and supplies to the resistance. This will enable them to fight back against the occupying Germans. Back in the UK, the first amphibious exercise for American troops takes place at Slapton Sands, Devon. The exercise involves 16,000 assault troops, and is a rehearsal of the techniques that will be used on D-Day itself. February over a long period, Allied Air Forces, RAF Bomber Command, and the United States Army Air Forces 8th Air Force, have been making a series of heavy air raids against German cities. German fighter aircraft defend against these attacks, and there are heavy casualties on both sides of this aerial fighting, and many German civilians are also killed. The Germans are less able to replace these losses of airmen and aircraft than the Allies. As a result, by the time of D-Day the German air force will not be strong enough to oppose the Allied landings in France. In response to these attacks, the Germans begin a series of bombing raids on the UK, known as the Little Blitz. They are less intense than the Blitz of 1940, 1941 and last until March, although the worst attacks are during February. Meanwhile, back in the UK, the training and preparations for D-Day continue. March. The Allied Headquarters for D-Day, Chief or Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, moves from Norfolk House in central London to Bushy Park, on the western outskirts of the capital. It has grown too large for Norfolk House, and the Supreme Allied Commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, felt it necessary to move away from the distractions of London. On 6 March, Allied Air Forces carry out the first of many raids on the French railway network. This is part of the transportation plan, which aims to reduce the Germans' ability to use the French railways to transport troops and military supplies. After many months of debate, the combined chiefs of staff, the American and British heads of the armed forces, decide to delay the planned landings in the south of France. These landings, codenamed Operation Dragon, had originally been planned to take place simultaneously with D-Day, so that the German troops in France would be attacked from two directions. However there were insufficient Allied ships available to launch both invasions at once. For the Allied forces, planning and training continues. Now back to page 8 of Lieutenant Booth's company history will be left off. the 1st of March 1944, an advanced party of 30 enlisted men and one officer, 1st Lieutenant Arden Wilson in charge, left via trucks at 0, 800 hours to ready a new location for the company, and at 1600 hours the same day arrived at the Tor House, which is located about one mile west of Shagford, Devonshire, England. APO 649, map coordinates T1, 2, 1, 0. 9-0. The remainder of the company arrived on 5 March 1944. The movement was made with all t &E equipment which had been received. Authority was contained in Movement Order No. 717, Headquarters, Southern Bay Section, SOS, ETO USA, dated 4 March 1944. The tour house was rewired for electricity with power by a trailer-mounted 5 kilowatt generator. The rooms were cleaned and some were painted. Billets for the officers were at Pigiston, where similar renovations were made. Through this experience it was found that billets required a lot of time for upkeep, 
and has a tendency to detract from the primary mission. They are not necessarily conducive to good morale. We had our own barber shop in operation with Tech 5 Herve Descato and Tech 5 Harvey Martineau, wielding the clippers. Tech 5 John F. Rogers was placed in charge of public relations and given the responsibility of the company's photography. For those who wished to attend religious services, there were churches in Shagford for those of the Protestant faith, and Catholic services were held in Major Rudolph C. Main's home, in Gidelier Park, in Shagford. Changes made in the kitchen staff prior to leaving the previous area made a noticeable improvement in the quality of the mess. The improved mess boosted the men's morale and made possible the success of their primary mission. Recreational facilities for the men were ample at all times. Movies, pubs, radios, games, and dances contributed to making relaxation an actuality.